Hello and welcome to a very special episode of Palace Confidential. And it's been a year of extraordinarily anticipated royal books, but none more so than the one written by my guest today. During his time as royal correspondent for The Times, Valentine Lowe has broken a number of royal stories, including that the palace was investigating claims of bullying made by staff against the Duchess of Sussex. His new book, called Courtiers, The Hidden Power Behind the Crown, looks at the fascinating position occupied by those who work for the royal family and how they shape what goes on. Valentine is with me now. Welcome. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for having me on. We have so much to discuss, <laughs> including your behind-the-scenes account of Megxit, among other things. But before we get into it, just tell us, where did the idea for the book come from? It came from... M Megan's interview with Oprah Winfrey, when she spoke about... Also, oh, something good came of that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. When yeah. she spoke about the institution, she contrasted the institution with the family uh, and basically was having a dig at the people who worked there, the men in grey suits, as, as Diana used to call them, mm. and implying that really a lot of what went wrong in her time in the royal family was down to the people who worked behind the scenes, the palace advisors, the men mm. in grey suits. and. The idea came up, well, let's have a look at them. Who are they? What do they do? And are they as bad as they seem? And do you think that it was um, that interview with Oprah that meant that a lot of people you spoke to felt aggrieved enough to, to speak up and get their side across? I think they felt that um, it was a valid exercise to, to, to explain what they did because no one's ever had a serious look at who these people are and what mm. they do. And, it, and it's very easy to caricature them. Uh, as the men in grey suits, um, a sort of untrustworthy, Machiavellian, scheming bunch. Uh, and actually, a lot of them are very public-spirited and trying to do a decent job. And what, who are they? What kind of people are they? they? You know, from your book and from descriptions from various members of the royal family, they seem to sort of like be part staff, part friend, part relative. How, how do they get that balance right in those jobs? It's very difficult because you're doing a job that's both professional and personal mm. um, and the thing of being a fr it's very interesting just to go back in history a bit um, there was um, someone called Lord Stamforden who worked for the royal family for ages and ended up being George V's private secretary and he died still in post in, in his 80s and when he died George V said that his loss is irre irreparable uh, and Queen Mary uh, said that um, George was like a child who'd lost a dear nanny Oh, uh, it was wow. extraordinary. That was the sort of closeness of the relationship. But th they do have to be professional. Um, but they do also, they can become almost like a friend. Uh, and one very interesting example of that was someone called Jamie Lowther Pinkerton, who was William and Harry's first private secretary. Uh, and he would, he would always have said that while working for them, he was not a friend. He was an advisor. He was mm. a professional. And all the courtiers... I spoke to all absolutely adamant they're not friends but by the time um, Jamie finished working for them he, he had become a friend of Williams he was um, his son was a page boy at their wedding uh, Jamie is godfather to Prince George mm. and there's no doubt that Jamie and I think partly this is a function of him having been there when William and Harry were relatively young so in a way he could have young adults he saw them kind of growing into their roles as role uh, as as members of the royal family mm. um uh, and yeah he became a friend it sounds to me like it must be one of the most all-consuming blurred lines duties do, do you think that you mentioned that this very close friend jamie left is there a just an inevitable shelf life in these jobs where you just can't stand it anymore uh, I think there can be a shelf life. It, it can be very difficult. And um, we're seeing that right now yeah. with uh, Sir Edward Young, yeah. who, was the, who worked for the Buckingham Palace for a long time, worked for the Queen, uh, ended up as the Queen's private secretary. He's now staying on, for a f but only for a few months, because mm. Sir Clive Alderton, the King's private secretary, worked with him when he was Prince of Wales. He's going to be the number one guy. And basically, Sir Edward is going to do the handover. So... Mm. That's an example of it being a short shelf life. But some of them stay there for years. And in fact, Sir Clive has been there for a long time. He had a stint as uh, Prince Charles's foreign affairs advisor, essentially, became deputy private secretary, then went off to become ambassador to Morocco, and then came back as his principal private secretary. Mm -hmm. He's one of the longest serving 
private secretaries for Charles. Um, wow. And I think he will be there for the duration. Now, you said that um, Diana used to sort of like eye-rollingly refer to men in grey suits. Yeah. But there doesn't seem to be an enormous amount of women. Is that fair? It, it is absolutely and fair. Why I mean, is I that? mean th there are women, but mm. you, I'll notice Charles, Prince Charles, now the king, has never had a woman private secretary, principal private secretary ever. Mm. He's had about 10, I think. Prince William, who has done what he can to kind of modernize how he runs the household and has really tried to make it a, a bit more inclusive. He has never had a woman uh, as principal private secretary. So, yeah. And don't get me started on the lack of ethnic minorities. Uh, yes. Well, that's another interesting thing, isn't it? It's a pretty a pale male stale environment. But do you think, is there, I'm being cheeky with this, but is it just that King Charles can't bear the idea of being yelling at a woman it's my he's like you know he much more likely to feel comfortable losing his temper well that. well he, he he does yell a bit i mean yeah. he, in in the description of someone i spoke to he goes to from naught to 60 in a flash well we've seen uh, haven't we yeah, yeah we see him with the pens yeah. but he i think he recovers quite quickly and it's i don't think it's necessarily aimed at people personally um it's aimed at situations um mm. but he does get does get frustrated uh, does he not like to shout at a woman um i'm not so sure about that <laughs> what, there was someone called sally osman who was his communications secretary for a while um and he welcomed her you know she was the new thing and then uh, within a week um he lost his temper, and later he said to someone else, you know, he was very worried that he, he might have put Sally off uh, already after a new week. Wow. So he you, really may well, you may as well know what you're getting in for, but, yeah. but what do you think, do you think the courtiers have, in their ways, shaped the kind of king that Charles will be? I think they, partly they've shaped the kind of king he'll be, but also they've reflected it. I mean, it's very interesting, the different courtiers, the different sort of private secretaries he's had at different times of life have kind of reflected who Charles was. So there was a time when he was very much about setting up his charities. He was the prince with a social conscience and, and the successful advisors from that era were those who were very much in tune with that and the unsuccessful ones and they were unsuccessful unsuccessful ones were the ones who didn't really kind of believe in charles's mission in the way he did but later charles moved on to different things and he became he wanted to cast himself more as a kind of global statesman and and it was the job of the people around him to help shape that and reflect that and, and advance that. Mm. What about Charles's younger life? Do you see parallels with some of the frustrations that you talk about with Charles when he was making his way as a young prince and sort of like looking at shaping his future as the king? Is there any parallel with that and his son Harry? Yeah, I think that there are parallels. Um, Charles was faced when young with a long period of being the heir to the throne. Uh, and he wanted to do more than some previous Prince of Wales's uh, have yeah. done, which they basically had a nice time. Yeah, he, I don't know he, why you he, wouldn't do that. But he, <laughs> <laughs> he wanted yeah. to do some good, and yeah. it's fantastic. And he uh, had this idea of helping disadvantaged youth, mm. um, and that eventually became the Prince's Trust, which is a phenomenally successful charity and has helped more than a million young people, and it's brilliant. I mean, the list of people he's helped is, yeah. is long. Uh, but there were, there were some people within Buckingham Palace who were not helpful at that time, and I think Charles got frustrated mm. and you know, in different ways. Um, Harry has been frustrated, and, and Harry has had a similar drive to Charles in the sense that, you know, he... Harry is aware that he has, or he felt that he had a limited shelf life. I found that fascinating because look at, he could absolutely have an amazing legacy with things like the Invictus Games. Why does that have to come with a shelf life? I know, but he felt yeah. that people, royals become, if they're not on the track to become monarch, they become less relevant mm. uh, as they grow older, as they move down the line of succession, and as younger, more glamorous, more interesting roles come along. After all, the Duke of Kent, who these days kind of even knows who the Duke of Kent was, but he was mm. once something like, I don't know, eighth in line to the throne. But um, So Harry felt that by the time Prince George was gonna be 18 or so, no one would care about Harry. So he had this 
relatively small number of years in which he could make an impact, and he was very keen to make an impact quickly, which is why um, the Invictus Games, he, he, he did it fantastically swiftly. He, from having the idea to it being realized was just one year. Mm. I mean, it was breakneck speed. That's incredible. But it does seem, in fairness, like there is a certain amount of culture of no matter how powerful you are, you could be the king, the queen, the prince of Wales, but there is this whole system that you come up against within, that, within the walls of those palaces. Yeah, there is a system, but there's another way of looking at it, that, 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 that you're there as part of an institution. Mm. Uh, and the Queen was always very firm that the long-term security and stability of the institution was what mattered above mm. uh, any, any sort of personal needs or desires. Well, let's move that. It brings us nicely on to Prince Andrew. Um, <laughs> God bless him. Car yeah. crash interviews, bad choices. Do you think... If he'd had better courtiers, things would have been different. Uh, he had a very good advisor in some, in some respects in the form of a woman called Amanda Thirsk, who is very sharp, very dedicated, incredibly hardworking. But is this the woman who organized the Newsnight yes, interview? Yes, yeah. uh, as well. So she, yeah. she, did, she did a lot of good for Andrew. I mean, she helped him when he was um, setting up his pitch at Palace thing, which, you know, at a time when his reputation was not terrific, uh, it gave him some kind of validation. Mm. But but um, she had a blind spot about the media. She didn't really understand the media. And when Epstein, Epstein kind of revived itself, um, and the accusations surfaced again, because the, the accusations had been around for some number of years, um, and then he, when he was arrested for the second time and, and when he died, they, they resurfaced. And mm. Interesting, there was no new accusation against Andrew. The evidence against him and what Virginia Giuffre was saying hadn't changed. There's nothing new there. But somehow the pressure, the pressure was renewed and it wasn't going away. And um, she thought, well, may, maybe we just have to do an interview. But the problem was that Andrew had form. A few years, a couple of years or so earlier, he'd given an interview to the Sunday Times, and it was an absolute car crash. It was a disaster. He came across as a fool uh, who wasn't master of his brief, couldn't answer the most basic questions, even mm. questions which he should have been prepared for. Um, and therefore, um, in the light of that, the Newsnight interview was really a dodgy thing to do. And even if you decided you had to do it, you should have prepared him within an inch of his life. Absolutely, yeah. And you should have prepared him to, uh, A, make sure you say something to express sympathy about the women who've been victims of Epstein. And also you should have removed all those incredibly foolish remarks about sweating and Pizza Express in working, I mean, daft stuff, which anyone with any public relations now would realize would play extremely badly. But they just they didn't have the media experience and they weren't listening to sufficient outside voices to, to be warned. It's fascinating, isn't it? But Andrew, um, you talk about also work with Charles to try to get rid of another big name, Sir Christopher Geit. Um, is it fair to say that often the courtiers are, are simply victims of family feuds and end up as collateral in, in that with their careers? I don't think it happens very often. Mm. I mean, and Christopher Geit was. He, Christopher Geit used to be very close to Charles. I mean, they used to have private meetings in the summer up in Scotland um, where they'd discuss big issues in the long term. And mm. Christopher Geit was incredibly clever chap, um, still is a clever chap, uh, and, and Charles admired his intellect. Um, but there was a time when Christopher wanted to um, merge the sort of palace communications empires, and to cut a long story short, uh, Charles thought it was a bad idea and thought he was trying to nick or defang his own press office. Mm. Um, and. Charles basically became rather suspicious and less enamored of Christopher after that. Um, and then later, after the death of Philip, uh, Christopher Guy made a speech which was interpreted in, within Charles's household as a bit of a takeover grab, telling the, royal, the rest of the royal family what to do. Wow. Um, and Christopher ended up being ousted, um, essentially, because he'd crossed Charles and his household. The mental gymnastics that go on, but yeah. um, 
do they ever, the courtiers, do they ever get to tell off the royals? I understand Fergie's had a dressing down. Yeah, Fergie did have a dressing down, but, but, but Fer Fergie was on the way out by then. Uh, <laughs> so it was she, safe. She was yeah. already separated yeah. from Andrew, so I think they, yeah. they, they felt quite confident about that. Yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, William seems to come out of your book as someone who has a healthy relationship with his staff. Um, he yeah, loves yeah. informality and he's very cautious about things like background checks for donors and things, which was, would be well advised in other quarters, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the informality, it's very interesting, the, informality, the, the levels of formality and informality. You know, in Charles's household, when he was Prince of Wales, it was, you know, the first thing in the morning, it was Your Royal Highness, and so after yes. that, and last thing at night, it was Your Royal Highness. Uh, and William, there was none of that. There, with his closest advisors, it would definitely be first name terms. Um, but but they, they were cautious to um, call him Prince William and Sir when they were in company. Mm. And there was a, f a fascinating kind of detail, which I kind of love, was in the very early days, it came when they were sort of young adults, um, he had a tiny team around them. William had a very, very small team, and it was very informal. They'd sort of share pizzas with their, with their advisors. Um, but they would, the, the advisors would always get up when they came in the room. And William and Harry would always say, no, no, please don't get up. And the next time they come to the room, they'd all get up because they believed that um, they should get you. This is how you're going to be treated as a member of the royal family. People are going to get up when you come in the room. And so these, these advisors thought, we've got to get them used to this. We've got to get them used to being a member of the royal family. Wow. And eventually, after a while, William and Harry just stopped saying, please don't get up. They just, they just, <laughs> they just gave up. They lost that battle. Oh, my God. Um, one story that has long been discussed is Tiara Gate. Um, and you provide some clarity on this one. Yes, I mean, from, from what I understand, um, the, the original version of that story which surfaced suggested there was a row about which tiara uh, Meghan would have for her wedding. And I don't think that's the case. That's, I mean, that's wrong. I mean, she was given by the Queen a choice of tiaras. She chose one. It's the one she wrote, wore at the wedding, and that was all absolutely fine. Where the problem came was a short while later, was that um, she wanted to have a, a fitting. So. It was for, uh, for her hair, because it, you, you, as you can imagine, wearing a tiara and having your hair done for your wedding, they're closely entwined. You, um, we've one, all been there, Valentine. We have, we've we all have. been there, yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, Meghan's hairdresser was in town. I, I think he was based in Paris. He, he was in town, and therefore she wanted a fitting. Uh, and the problem was that Angela Kelly, who was the Queen's dresser and a lot more beside, who basically had the keys, mm. controlled access to the tiara, she wasn't around. And Meghan was demanding, Meghan and Harry were demanding that we have the fitting today. And Angela, said it's, Angela Kelly said, sorry, I'm not available. And that caused a certain amount of um, dissent in the ranks, you say. Oh dear. Um, well, you actually do paint quite a detailed picture of the entrance and eventual exit of Meghan and Harry. And the problems seemed to start very early there, didn't they? Yeah, I think, so. I mean, the problems started before the wedding. I mean, there were, there were a lot of rows uh, before the wedding about all sorts of things, not just the tiara, about the choir, about the food. Uh, and there was a problem when um, the kind of, the drip, of inf the drip of news stories. Before the wedding, yeah. you'd always have a drip of news stories. The palace would put out little details about the cake, uh, about the dress, about the whatever, um, to keep the media happy. Uh, and somehow Meghan thought we ought to change that because it wasn't suiting her for some reason. Uh, and they had to rip up plans. And some poor woman was uh, presented an alternative plan and Meghan was really unhappy with this alternative plan and said to this woman, listen, if there's anybody else I can get to do this, believe me, I would. That is my favourite quote from the book. It's just such a devastating it's thing to say to such a crushing somebody. thing to say in front of other people. It's yeah. just extraordinary. And now, Samantha Cohen's another one who has worked with the Sussexes. She was very popular. She was a very popular member of the Queen's staff before she moved to work for them. What, what was her experience of that? I think Sam, who, uh, as you say, was very popular, very highly regarded, and gone on well, you know, Harry knew her well. When she, when she started, Harry knew her well and liked her, and she yeah. liked Harry. Uh, and she's a, Sam is a great problem solver. She's incredibly sort of can-do personality. Uh, and um, 
she just found it really difficult. I think she was asked to do things which a private secretary wouldn't normally be, be asked to do. And I think she was treated harshly. She was, I think she was shouted up by, by Meghan and, and possibly Harry, I don't know. Mm. Uh, and, you know, she, she's got broad shoulders, Sam, but she, I think she found it very difficult. She was said to have said that uh, dealing with them was like dealing with a couple of teenagers. Yeah, it's fascinating. That's the thing. And it, it, I think sometimes in our press, it becomes all about Meghan's deaverish behaviour. But Harry was capable of angry emails and strops as well. Yeah, I mean, mm. Harry, who has a long track record of not trusting the courtiers from the other household, from Buckingham yeah. Palace or from Clarence House, he really had it in for uh, Sir Edward Young, Queen's private secretary, and Sir Clive Alston, Charles's private secretary, and from, from the accounts I've been told, used to send them incredibly rude emails. Mm. Now, a lot of um, you say that the staff called Meghan a narcissistic sociopath. I mean, that's quite strong. It is strong, <laughs> and, and they'd also yeah. they'd also say we were played. They, you know, how so? They they felt that um, she always had an agenda to get out. Um, really? the, the, From the, even before, even before it was, that her, we knew yeah, about it, yeah. yeah. And they they had been devoted. They had really tried hard to make it work, uh, and but they they had a rough time and they they, they felt treated badly. How do you um, feel about the successes having done all this research? Um, I think it's quite complex because I think there was never what they wanted. And what the royal family, really, the Queen, felt able to provide. There was, no, there was never going to be any common meeting ground. There was, there was no compromise. So in a sense, I think it was inevitable that they should leave. But the, the, the tragedy was it was so acrimonious. It didn't have to be so acrimonious. Mm -hmm. Now, the royal, I think the institution and the people who worked for them tried hard to show flexibility, to... Um, have a different way of working. Uh, you know, there was one one courtier, senior courtier called Miguel Head, who had a meeting with Meghan before the wedding and said, "Listen, we can. You know, there's no fixed way of you fulfilling this role. Um, we can we let's, can talk. Let's craft it. Let's, yeah. let's craft it. Yeah. Uh, so they they, they were they were going out of their way, and someone else, David Manning, former ambassador to Washington, who's their foreign affairs advisor, he cooked up this plan that suggested they spend some time living in South Africa. Uh, didn't work in the end, but it was a sort of, the point is it was a, a big effort to try and show flexibility, mm. to try and imaginative ways of working. But where the institution went wrong is that in the about the sort of first year or so of their marriage, and in particular between January 2019 and about late summer, early autumn of that year, that was the period when Meghan and Harry, in particular Meghan, was deeply unhappy. Mm. Uh, and they were obviously frustrated. And no one, no one really kind of flagged it up. No one had a big meeting in which they sat down and said, listen, this is going wrong. Let's talk about this, let's work out how we can solve it. Yeah. Uh, and they, they didn't do that until it was too late. And I think that was a failure on their part. So yeah, Harry and Meghan could be difficult. I mean, I, think the, I don't think there's any denying that. But I don't think the palace rose to the occasion either. What do you think that the people you spoke to would wanted to achieve out of speaking to you about, about all of this, if anything? I think what they wanted to achieve is say, listen, there's, there's another story here. Meghan has done a very good job of portraying herself as a victim of this cold, unfeeling institution. And, and they're saying, actually, it's more complicated than that. Mm. Have you heard from any of the Sussex's legal team? Not yet. Uh, but <laughs> Not I think yet. They're... That's rather <laughs> ominous. <laughs> yeah. They know my email address. <laughs> Watch this space. And you quote one insider who believes that ultimately... Meghan did Harry the greatest kindness. What, what is that? Yeah, I mean, that was, I think that's the most, possibly the most significant quote in the whole book. And what this, per this person who knows Harry, who doesn't really approve of what Harry and Meghan did, but they said to me, in a way, she did him the greatest kindness because they knew that for the last couple of years of his working life, Harry was really unhappy, but they didn't know what to do about it. And then Meghan came along and showed him a way out. Mm. And in that way, 
possibly should do them the greatest kindness. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. Mm. It's fascinating. Well, the reminder that Valentine Lowe's excellent book is called Courtiers, The Hidden Power Behind the Crown, and it's out now, published in the UK by Headline. You can click the link below if you want to buy it. That's all we have time for on this special episode of Palace Confidential, but join us again for more royal news and views next Thursday. See you then. Bye-bye.